Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Open House for 2022 for NUS Law. Uh, my name is Wayne Courtney. I am the Vice Dean of Academic Affairs and Undergraduate Studies uh, at the faculty. And this is the undergraduate session, which is why I'll be your moderator. I should introduce the panel with me. On my left is Arif Jamal, who's the Vice Dean of Graduate Studies. And you'll see more of him later if you stay tuned for the postgraduate session. On my right immediately is Professor Simon Chesterman, who's the most important person in the faculty because he's the dean. And he's wearing two hats because he's about to become, or is, and, and will exclusively become the dean of the new NUS college. And on my far right is uh, Leia Chua, who happens to be a former student of mine, uh, but she's here to give you a bit of experience about life as an LLB student uh, in the faculty. So before we get into the program, I should outline what we're going to do today. We'll go for about an hour. I'm going to start by just outlining briefly what we're doing. I'll hand over to Professor Chesterman to introduce you to the faculty and, and say a few words as Dean. I'll then talk a little bit about what we offer here in our undergraduate programs at NUS. I'll then pass to Leia, who can give you the students' insight about what life is really like uh, as a law student and being a law student here in particular. And then we'll finish the session for the last 20 minutes or so with, with some Q&A. And, and uh, Arif on my left will moderate that and then we'll have some contributions from various panel members. So uh, with that, I might hand over to Professor Chesterman to introduce the faculty. Thanks very much, Wayne. And thank you to everyone for uh, joining us. It's a great pleasure to at least welcome you virtually like this. And I do encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to do the virtual tour of campus. And then if you have the chance, come to campus, see what it's like to be here at the beautiful Booker Tima campus, uh, nestled at the edge of the Botanic Gardens. Uh, it's good to be here with uh, Wayne, Arif, uh, and especially Leah. Thank you for representing students today. Uh, we would normally have the Law Club president, but unfortunately, Yong Kang can't be with us today. Yong Kang, shout out to you uh, and all the work you do with your colleagues in, in the Law Club. Uh, but Leah, as a sort of former Law Club person and as uh, someone who's very active in uh, spaces, which you might talk about later, Thanks for being here. So what I thought I'd do is talk a bit about um, uh, myself, just to introduce myself, a bit about why you might be watching this, uh, and then obviously say something about the law school at NUS. Uh, so for myself, I'm an Australian national, but I've been resident in Singapore for 16 years. I'm a permanent resident now. Uh, but I met my Singaporean wife in England. We moved to America, had an American son. Uh, he and I are now permanent residents. He goes off to NS next year. Uh, and we've had two more Singaporeans in the meantime. Uh, but I, I say all this as someone who has taught and interviewed potential students around the world uh, and why I stay in Singapore is precisely because uh, it's for the same reason that we do well at NUS in terms of rankings, which is that we have an amazing cohort of students. Uh, I often tell our students that they are the best ambassadors for NUS uh, and they're the reason I came and the reason that I stay. Um, but there is a tendency at events like this to really focus on, on how questions. How do you become one of these students? How do you get a scholarship or financial aid? How do you get ahead in law school? Uh, and these are all important questions. Uh, but if you like, I'd, I'd really push you to take a step back and not just think about how to get into law school, but why. Why are you thinking about getting into law school? Why are you attending this webinar? Uh, and why are you going to make uh, a very impactful choice uh, about your university program both what to study and where, uh, and whether NUS fits into that. Uh, and so that brings me to the second thing I want to talk about, which is you. So why are you here? Why are you watching this? Uh, you, did your parents make you watch it? Uh, are you, uh, you sitting there with friends trying to debate where to go? Uh, and as you debate these questions, maybe one of the things you're thinking about is what? What you want to be? What you want to be when you grow up, as people often say. Uh, and I would also push you not to really think just about that question. Um, because the reality of the economy these days is that the world is changing faster and faster. Uh, the skills that people acquire need to be continually updated. And so the, the what you want to be question is no longer static. Uh, and so people don't, or at least shouldn't really say that I just want to be a lawyer, uh, that I want to be an investment banker or something else. What you should really be thinking about, I would suggest, is who, who you want to be, what kind of skills you want to develop, what kind of perspectives you want to develop, and how you are going to uh, pursue those uh, interests. Because as you go through the next 30, 40 years uh, of a career, the only thing that's gonna be a constant in your life is you. There is going to be change. Uh, in your lifetime, you've seen enormous change in terms of technological developments, uh, the impact of globalization, 
Uh, the practice of law, something we obviously focus on, has been transformed by both of these things, uh, and it will continue to be transformed. More recently, we've been transformed, obviously, by the pandemic. Happily, you're likely to enter university as we transition out of some of the worst aspects of that. Uh, but do think about these skills, these sort of the passions that you develop, what you want to be, who you want to be, uh, the type of skills you want to cultivate. Uh, and that maybe brings me to NUS Law. Because obviously we're a professional school. We train a plurality of Singapore's lawyers. Uh, but as we say in our tagline, we're NUS Law, uh, Asia's global law school. We aspire to being all these three things. We are, of course, the national law school. We produce, it used to be almost all of Singapore lawyers. It's still the plurality of Singapore's lawyers. Uh, and that's an important part of what we do. But we're also an Asian law school. We try to equip our students with the skills that will be useful to them as they, as they look to the region. Uh, and we're a global law school. We really see ourselves, hopefully, as one of the best law schools in the world, preparing our students to take on the world's challenges, preparing our faculty uh, to showcase their research at a global level. Uh, and so what we're trying to do here is obviously teach you some of the law. We want to give you an understanding of what the law is. Uh, but we also try to give you skills that will be useful in the practice of law, but also in other careers. Uh, so critical analytical skills, communication skills, team building skills that will be useful in all sorts of careers. Uh, in addition, we want to give you perspective. We want to help you understand not just what the law is, how it's practiced, but why it is the way it is. Uh, and that's why we have a rich comparative component uh, that encourages our students to see the law from multiple directions. Why we have theoretical subjects that teach you not just why the law is the way it is, but how it came to be that way, the forces that shape the law. Uh, and that was actually one of the first reasons why I got interested in law myself in the first place, uh, because I was interested in understanding how power is regulated in society. So all of this translates to an academic program that is rich and rigorous. Uh, and as you think about studying law, maybe you're thinking, OK, I want to study law. Why should I study at NUS? What's so special about NUS? Uh, so one thing to highlight is just our network. If you're even remotely going to pra practice law in Singapore, our alumni connections are both testimony to our rich history, but also to the connections we make available to our current students. We count among our alumni the current Chief Justice, the past Chief Justice, the current Attorney General, the past Attorney General, partners in major law firms, not just here, but also abroad in places like New York, London, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and elsewhere. Uh, and so we have that sort of rich academic program. We have those, those, uh, those skills. Uh, but also, hopefully, something that will come out in the course of today's webinar is that it's not just about study. I mean, it's hard to get into law school. It's hard to do well in law school. But it should also be fun. We want to educate but also to provide space for students to grow, to develop themselves. Uh, that's why I'm so pleased that Leia's here to talk about the student experience. Uh, because if all you do at law school is spend your time in the library, then you've missed out on a lot. Uh, and candidly, that's been one real reservation we've had about the way in which we've been forced to carry on the law school during the pandemic, uh, is it's limited our ability to have those outside of the classroom experiences. But we've been pushing to open up as much as we can and again, by the time you enter law school, I'm optimistic that, that we'll be at full strength and full operations. So that's, if you like, a kind of taster. Um, but the last thing I'll say is um, that this really is an important moment for those of you who are watching this, who are about to take a really impactful decision. And for many of you, it might well be the first time you're really taking ownership of your educational pathway. Up until now, it's been, how do I get through PSLE? How do I get through JC? What subjects do I take? How do I do well? Now you're really making a choice that should be yours. By all means, take advice, but it has to be yours. It has to be an intentional one. And be aware that the, the shift to university is not just about taking ownership. It's about a different style of education. As I often tell my own students, uh, if, in, if in my classes you can answer the questions that I ask, fine, you're a good student. If you can predict my questions, then uh, maybe you're a very good student or maybe you've got a good set of notes. But the really good students, the great students, the ones I remember, uh, are the ones who ask me questions that I hadn't even thought about. And that, again, is why all of us, I think, become and stay academics uh, to end where I began. It's the quality of the students, the richness of the intellectual environment that we co-create together with them. And if all of that sounds exciting to you, if all of that sounds like something you want to be part of, then my colleagues would uh, very much look forward to receiving an application and hopefully welcome you to our beautiful Booker Tima campus in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, so <clears throat> let me just tell you a little bit about what you're getting yourself in for uh, if you uh, apply and are accepted to join NUS Law. 
So I'll divide that into a few topics. I'll start by talking about our program first, which you probably know is called the LLB or Bachelor of Laws degree. Then I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about how classes are run, what you might expect, uh, both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. Uh, so our basic program is the Bachelor of Laws degree. It's a four-year degree, full-time. And generally speaking, our students spend the two and a bit years doing compulsory core modules that provide the foundations of legal training. And then they spend their last year and a half to two years doing electives. So that's a chance where you really get to pursue a broad variety of interests in all sorts of topics. I'll talk about some of those later. Uh, and there'll be opportunities to go on exchange as well. Now, in that core curriculum for the first two years or so, pretty much all your subjects are fixed because one of the advantages of, of our law degree, indeed one of our requirements, is that we satisfy the academic requirements necessary for you to practice in Singapore. And of course, we expect all lawyers in Singapore to have a certain core amount of knowledge, and, and that's what you'll get in the first few years. So you'll study stuff like contracts, torts, property, criminal law, which is, is much more popular than the previous ones, um, constitutional administrative law, Singapore law, and Sing Singapore legal systems, and so forth. Uh, and those classes are generally uh, a combination of lectures uh, and smaller group seminars and tutorials. So a lecture, of course, might be 250 odd people. But in small group teaching, you know, as I was doing today, we might be down to a class of 7, 10, 15 students, which really allows for a great amount of interaction between the instructor and students and students among themselves. Uh, once you get past that corpus of essential knowledge, you have a year and a half or, or two years to study. Uh, I say a year and a half or two years because we've recently changed our curriculum a little bit to add a few more compulsory modules, and I'll just say something about those. Uh, until the coming academic year, our core modules had consistently been just law-only modules uh, of the nature I mentioned. Uh, starting from this year, so it will affect the cohort, which, which will be you as my, our first cohort, we're introducing two, I guess you might call them extra-legal or paralegal type modules, um, which are designed to give you broader skills. Now, that's not only because we think that's a good thing in itself, but it's because we recognize that legal practice today is not what it used to be, as Simon mentioned. And lawyers need to be far more adaptable and more broadly skilled than they have been in the past. Uh, so those two new modules we'll be adding, uh, one is on quantitative reasoning. Uh, now, before you freak out and say, look, I'm not a maths person, I'm not a stats person, the whole reason I did law was to avoid that, uh, don't worry, it, it's a user-friendly course. Everyone in the university does it. Um, Look, if musicians who play clarinet to do it, you'll be perfectly able to do it. Um, and there will be some law-related type questions in that module. Um, the other advantage of that module is, is it'll be one of the rare instances you will have to mix with other students in the university. Uh, so although the upside of being here at Bukit Timah campus is, as Simon said, it, it's remarkably beautiful. We're in a UNESCO site. Uh, the downside is that there's limited student interaction with people who aren't lawyers. And well, some law students think that's probably a good thing. Um, I don't think so. I think it's good for you to mix with, with people from all walks of life. Uh, the second module we've introduced this year as a new compulsory is on law and technology. And again, we've introduced that to broaden your skill base and to respond to a need seen both within the university and within the profession for students to know something about technology that goes beyond swiping or using WhatsApp. Uh, now, that module will cover two kinds of relationships between law and technology. Part of it will be about how we use technology and law. So, you know, what sorts of automated tools or AI systems could I use in my legal practice to make my job easier? The other kind of relationship we look at is the way we deal with legal issues in technology. So, for example, how do we regulate cryptocurrencies? Um, can we have new kinds of digital property? How do NFTs work and how would artwork work in the future if everything's signed authentically using certain sorts of tokens? Um, how do we deal with biases in AI systems? Right? So they're the sorts of things that we'll look at in the module. And I think it's going to be really exciting. So as you being our first cohort, you'll start that module, but you won't do it until your third year of studies. Uh, it'll come at the end of your compulsories. Now, when you get to third year, the world opens up, you get to taste a whole range of electives, uh, which is more exciting for some students. And I'm pleased to say we have a, a, a vast array of, of electives. I think it's quite remarkable at NUS that for what is, by global standards, kind of a, a medium-sized faculty, I'd say, we're about 1,000 undergraduate students, we run over 100 electives each year. Uh, and so it's a really rich uh, array of choices. 
everything from, as Simon mentioned, comparative law, Asian and ASEAN law. Um, you've got commercial interests specific to Singapore, like maritime law and shipping, commercial arbitration. Uh, you've got things like private law with law of obligations, remedies. This year, we're running an economic analysis of contract law in times of COVID. Um, in the tech space, we've got things like regulation of digital platforms, uh, biotechnology, um, some topics on digital finance and so forth. Um, so it's a, re a really interesting range of electives. One of the other things that really attracts students to our course is the opportunity to go on exchange. And our stats are that roughly about 50% of our students will at some point in their degree take an exchange at a foreign university. Uh, now, now our exchange program falls into two kinds. The majority of students take a one semester exchange uh, and that's just our regular exchange program. And we've got 50 odd, I think at last count, partner institutions. Uh, you may have seen our most recent addition uh, to that list was the University of Cambridge. Uh, and I think that's, that's an indication of the esteem with which NUS is held overseas that we're able to partner with really prestigious institutions like that. The other option you have if you're a glutton for punishment or, or re really interested in a more profound sort of learning experience is our Exchange Plus program. And the deal with that is you actually leave NUS for an entire year. It's your final year of studies. Uh, the result is you only spend three years getting your bachelor's degree at NUS. And uh, we credit the final year of study towards that process. But in your final year, you'll be permanently overseas getting a master's degree from a foreign institution. And we've got some good institutions on the list. So places like New York University, uh, Melbourne University are examples. Right? It's a really interesting program, a, an efficient way, I suppose, to get a bachelor's and a master's from a foreign institution if that grabs you. So that's our core program. Now, some of you might feel, well, look, law is interesting and that's fine, but what if I want to do other stuff? Um, and one of the peculiar aspects, I guess, of, of, of Simon and me, apart from sort of being in the faculty management, both being PRs, both being Australians, is that we grew up in a system where people are forced to do a second degree. Right? So I did science, science Simon did. What did you? Arts. Arts, Simon did arts. Um, at NUS, that's still fairly exceptional for our students. Only about 20% of our students look outside of law for double degrees, but we do offer two double degrees at the moment. One is in business and law, and one is in economics and law. And those programs are five years long. You sort of, I guess, get a bit of efficiency because instead of doing two, three, or four year degrees, which would take you six to eight years, you get two degrees in five years um, because we credit between degrees. Uh, and you get a rich experience in a, in a non-law subject, so business or uh, economics. If that seems a little bit too much, if that's sort of the double patty burger, then you can go for the diet option, which is of two kinds. Uh, this year, we're pleased to announce a partnership with NUS College, and, and maybe Simon can answer more about that in the questions if he wants, uh, since he knows more about that than I do. But we've designed a program with NUS College where you pursue a basic law degree, a four-year law degree. So it's not a separate degree like there is with economics or business. But a large part of your law program is infused or mixed with NUS college modules and an NUS college experience. And so you get a really rich interdisciplinary um, experience. You'll spend time at NUS college. And at the same time, you come out with legal training as well. Uh, if that it's, as well seems a little bit too much, the, the most diet option you have is to pursue a minor as part of your law degree. And roughly speaking, that's about one semester worth of study. So you know, as I said, you've got about three, three and a half semesters clear for electives. You spend about one third of that time pursuing a minor in another faculty. And the range there is, is really vast. I mean, if I thought our electives are vast, the range in other faculties is truly vast. Uh, we have students doing things like forensic science, uh, music, computer science, business, all sorts of things. So, so it's a really exciting program if, if that grabs your fancy. Uh, so that's what we offer. Let me just say something about learning and teaching here, which might interest you in times of COVID. Uh, for the last couple of years, teaching has been a real challenge. Our perspective at NUS, and we're firmly committed to it, is that teaching in person and classes in person are by far the best experience when we can do it. And that's for, for a number of reasons. Uh, we think the teaching experience is much more rewarding, uh, both for us, although that, that's not really important, but more importantly for you. And that's both in terms of your dynamic with the teacher and your dynamic with other students. 
The other advantage of having students in person in campus is the opportunity for interaction outside of classes. And I think that's a really valuable aspect of, of education. And sadly, it's one thing that's, I think, sort of been attenuated in the last couple of years while students have been socially distanced and, and you know, learning from home. But going forward, as Simon said, we're expecting next semester, um, certainly all small groups will be face-to-face -face or mask-to-mask. -mask. Um, lectures we're still unsure about. Uh, there may be, it may be the case that 250 students is still too much, so your, your lectures are online. Uh, but generally, we're pushing as hard as we can for a face-to-face -face experience. Uh, lastly, don't forget, you know, it's not all just about the law and study and time in the library, as Simon mentioned. Uh, so there's plenty of law club activities, plenty of student activities. And I'll probably sort of stop there, because I think Leah's probably a better place to talk about those than me. Uh, so I might hand over to Leah. Leah has the well, depending on your, on your view, good fortune or misfortune of being my previous student in first year, she seems to have turned out okay, so, so I think I haven't scarred her too badly. So I'll pass it over to Leah. Hi, so I'm Leah. Um, I am a year four undergraduate, and I was involved in um, law club when I was in my second year, and right now I am also the current president of Spaces at BTC, which is a mental health subclub that we just established about a semester ago. So I guess I'll first answer, because I see there's like a question on the screen which talks about how we know, um, how do you know if you have the aptitude and the passion to study law? So I guess I'll share my um, application experience as well for many of you who are deciding on um, whether you should study law and also um, study law at NUS. So I think the first thing that um, caused me to want to study law is because I feel that it really helps to sharpen um, my thinking and the, you know, the clarity of thought. And also, I loved reading and writing. Um, I think that's one of the common reasons why a lot of students um, take up law as, a, as an undergraduate um, degree. Um, and if you like arguing, if you like um, articulating your thoughts, you like having opinions on things, I think law is a great degree for you to enter into. Um, and also, I think I really had a passion for wanting to do good, for wanting to be a force for good. And I think out of all the degrees that um, were open to me at that point of time, I think law really um, felt like the one that would help me to be able to make a change in this world. Um, and I think here at NUS Law, we have a great pro bono program. Um, I personally was involved in two big, um, two big programs called the State Court Student Representative Program um, that kind of allows you to do like an, it's kind of like an internship at the state courts where you actually go down, you get to speak to uh, members of the public, you get to write affidavits, um, and the other one that I did was the deputy, deputyship program. So that really um, allowed me to help a, a certain family um, draft a application for the um, uh, draft a dep deputyship order. Yeah. So, um, and then I think on to my second question as to why uh, law at NUS. Um, firstly, I think for many Singaporean students, um, law at NUS is um, firstly, as the professors have already mentioned, it is a great law school. Um, it, it is the best in Asia. It is, I think, the top 10 in the world right now. So we're told. <laughs> top 10 in the world. So um, that's honestly ranked higher than a lot of the international universities overseas as well. So secondly, when it came to financial considerations, um, as a Singaporean student especially, you do get a lot of subsidies from the government. So it is really an affordable option for you. And thirdly, I think, why NUS and not SMU Law? Um, because I really, first of all, I was enrolled into the USB program as well. So I am currently in USB, which is now the NUS college, which Prof. Chesterman is in charge of as well. Um, and I wanted that residential living experience as well as the interactions from students of other faculties. And NUS being a very, very, very wide institution, we have a campus at Cambridge and then we have one here as well at Bukit Timah campus. It really allows you to have a very um, meaningful university experience. Yeah, so um, do, should I continue answering the other yeah, questions sure, on the screen? If, yeah, if it's yeah. relevant to you. Okay, sure. So um, I think, and I think um, on to the second question about what are the perspectives on the recent news articles about many young lawyers leaving the profession. And if it's something that you think it's gonna influence your decision on whether to apply to law school or not, I think that my experience as a student um, really taught me that there are a lot of transferable skills that you learn having a law degree, right? And having that law degree 
um, really opens up many doors for you, not just in the legal industry, but um, I did, for example, an internship at Intellex, which is a legal tech firm. Um, it also helps you in many areas like writing properly, so you can go into journalism. Um, Prof Chesterman is an accomplished author himself. So with a law degree, you can do a lot of things. Um, and this is my opinion on why I think that you should do a law degree, not just, um, not just in Singapore, but in NUS as well. Yep. And back to Prof Courtney. Well, thank yeah. you. Um, so we've heard from everyone. What I might do now is we'll do some Q&A. And uh, uh, Arif is going to help sort of moderate this, and he'll read out the questions, and then we'll discuss them as a panel. Sure. Thanks, mate. OK, so Leah has uh, helpfully uh, taken up some of the more popular ones, ones that are being upvoted. So um, thank you for that. Let's go to some that are uh, still sort of live that are people are interested in. So one question is um, uh, asking about, um, uh, uh, it, it's a kind of more technical question, uh, but it was talk, talking a little bit about uh, um, what the dean of another law school in Singapore was saying about electives. And that dean says, you shouldn't just look at the number of electives, you should also look at how the electives are grouped and make sure that the um, uh, people that are teaching the electives kind of talk to each other. So do we, so the question is, how do we at NUS Law make sure that in fact the people that are giving electives in similar areas kind of work with each other? So I guess uh, it's hard to address as a paraphrase, I guess, based on, on, on what the Dean of SMU said. Uh, but I'd say this, we coordinate our program centrally and we look to start at the sort of offerings across the entire spectrum. So. Each year, for example, we'll say we want you know, to at least have sort of 10 offerings in, say, Asian law or 15 offerings in IP law or something. So, so that's our starting point. Um, then it, when it comes to actually find the modules, of course, that's going to vary from year to year because the staff change, some staff are on leave, um, some staff are teaching other things. We also have a very rich visitors program, which is an important part of our electives. Uh, so each year we get 20 odd, I think this year it's 25, um, visitors from overseas to come and teach intensive three-week modules uh, in our faculty. And some of those people are really, really impressive. Um, so I think coming up this year, we've got someone from Columbia. Last year was someone from Yale. I think next year is someone from Yale again. Um, we get experts from practice for the commercial type topics, particularly in maritime law and arbitration, uh, some real sort of international brand names. So. I guess I'd say first it's about our sort of overall coverage. So we, we sort of deal with that centrally. Second, it's about the people whom we get to teach. And of course, with the faculty, we get ex experts in. Um, with people from overseas, of course, we vet them and, and sort of hunt actively for the, 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 the most qualified and most interesting and hopefully some, some really big stars. Um, in, in terms of the other stuff, I guess, the other thing you can think about is the way electives are stacked perhaps, uh, although there's probably a better word than that, but the way you might start with some low grade electives and get to some more advanced electives. Uh, our system at NUS is relatively flat. There's not many progressions in electives. So uh, for example, it's not like you might do IP Law 1, then IP Law 2, then IP Law 3 as electives. Um, but we do have some areas where clearly there's interactions or an ability to take earlier electives and then build on them with later electives. Uh, so in arbitration law, for example, uh, it's highly recommended you might do international commercial arbitration as a, an inter introductory thing or as a starter to, to give you a taste of the topics and electives. And then there's probably 10 or 15 other arbitration electives you can go on to specialize. Uh, and you'll find the same with, say, IP. You could do the foundations of IP course. And then there'd be specialties, whether it's patents, whether it's copyright, whether it's comparative international copyright, whether it's biotech or whatever. So I guess I'd say that's how we deal with them. Thanks. Maybe just to, to weigh in on this as well. Uh, first, firstly, to say that uh, the Dean of SMU is a wonderful guy, yep. one of our graduates. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the, the other way in which we coordinate um, in this is not just on the teaching, but it overlaps with our research culture. So we have research centres in areas like law and business, banking and finance law, maritime law, artificial intelligence and technology. Uh, and so this also provides a, a focal point for research that is one of the reasons why faculty from around the world come visit us and contribute to the research culture 
Uh, and so in addition to work in the classroom, there are also opportunities for students to become research assistants, to get involved in some of these research projects or to contribute to that research culture uh, in addition. So uh, a couple of questions that I will uh, direct uh, to the dean. Um, Leah has spoken about the first one a little bit, uh, and in fact, perhaps both of them, but just to add your perspective. So one question is asking, since most of us haven't studied law in pre-university, how can we tell if we have an aptitude and passion for it? And then the second question is, why NUS Law over Oxbridge? <laughs> So great questions, and I think I, I really liked Leia's response. Um, a bit like my, my own daughter uh, is thinking about become a lawyer, becoming a lawyer because she's very opinionated and wants to win arguments. It's not exactly what you said. Uh, but the other thing that you said I, I think is quite important, and it's something candidly that's changed in Singapore over the past 15, 16 years that I've been here. Because uh, I've interviewed potential law students in Australia, the UK, the US, and Singapore. Uh, and when I first moved here, uh, it really struck me that in those other jurisdictions, when asked, why study law? Why do you want to study law? About half would say, save the world, heal the planet, fix inequality. In Singapore, 16 years ago, not so much. It tended to be good job, stable career, respectable. My parents might be able to do it. These days, I think there is much more consciousness uh, that a law degree is, is a thing to use, is a way of engaging in society. It's a way of making your opinion heard, but also making a difference. Uh, and that's one thing that's we've quite consciously cultivated that in the law school. Uh, and Leah mentioned the pro bono opportunities. Uh, we actually made pro bono mandatory. Uh, now, this is a very unusual compromise to sort of require people to do good things. And we debated it for some time because there's a real danger, I think, that if you have a sort of mandatory, everyone must do 20 hours of pro bono service, which is what we do, which is not a huge amount, uh, the concern is people do their 20 hours and they say, right, that's it. I'm never doing pro bono again. Uh, and we were quite nervous about that. But happily, uh, that has not been the case. The average number of hours, I think, is about 50 hours that our students do. Many, like Leah, do far more than that. Uh, and it, these aren't just projects that we're handing out to the students. These are projects that the students themselves develop, cultivate. Uh, so all this to say that law is about, uh, it, it's really about the pen being mightier than the sword. Uh, and that's maybe the last thing I'll say about aptitude, that one reason not to study law is just because you got the grades or just because you want to make money or just because you want to be powerful. Uh, if you don't love words, if you don't love reading, writing, speaking, uh, you're probably going to be pretty miserable in law school. Uh, and so part of this open house, obviously, is about selling the law school, saying how great it is. Uh, but if you don't love reading, writing, and speaking, maybe law's not for you. So that's the first question. Why NUS, why should you turn down a full scholarship to go to Oxbridge? Uh, so I'm not going to tell you to turn down a full scholarship to go to Oxford uh, or Cambridge. Uh, but, uh, I mean, there are great law schools there. Um, but for students who are thinking that there's a chance they're going to practice in Singapore, and the majority of Singaporeans who go off to England come back and practice here, the alumni network is incredibly important. Uh, and not to belabor it, but I think Leah also touched on the financial question. Once in one of these sessions, I was asked, well, studying in England is much more expensive than in Singapore, therefore it must be better. No. Uh, I mean, parents who are watching this, you're, you're already paying for a lot of the education that goes on here through government subsidies. Uh, we are acutely aware that we, we charge fees as well. We try to give value for money. Uh, but the amount that we invest in each student at NUS is at least comparable uh, to uh, the cost of an English education, and I think in many cases is significantly more. Plus, we have a lot of financial aid uh, because we do want to make sure that, uh, that students with an aptitude, with a passion for law, aren't denied it for financial reasons. Uh, and so if you're concerned about being able to afford law school, uh, then definitely you should look at NUS. Uh, and particularly with the recent financial aid package, I think I can say pretty confidently that none of you, if you're admitted into law school, will be financially prohibited from taking up that opportunity and taking advantage of it. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'll I want to direct this next question to Wayne, and then, Leah, I'm going to come to you with a couple of questions that are talking more about student things. The question is, I hear, uh, the, the, the questioner asks, I heard many law students transfer out of law school after their first year. From your experience, what kind of students en end up transferring out of law school, and what kind of students stay on? Cool. I'm not sure I agree with the starting point on that. I'll, I, in the faculty, we call that an attrition rate. Um, it sounds a bit gruesome, but it, we, we just mean the students we lose, is actually pretty low, 
It's very low. Very, very small. Very, very yeah. small. Uh, so, so I think I, I just say that that's someone's probably heard some misinformation on that. It's, it's, it's much smaller in Singapore than it is in my home jurisdiction of Australia, where there's a much greater attrition rate. Um, the, the main attrition we have, uh, to be candid, is actually from students who start doing the double patty burger, the, the two degrees, and often they will quit the non-law degree and come into law. Um, so if anything, I think that, that that's maybe an endorsement of doing law rather than not doing law. Uh, I should just explain why do students do that? Why do they quit their business or economics degree? It tends to be that they feel that if they're doing those degrees, they have less time to do law modules. And that makes sense because the program is naturally loaded with more non-law topics to let them finish in five years. Uh, but, but so, you know, in summary, I, I don't think we really lose many students in the first couple of years. And to the extent there's attrition, it tends to be from the double degree non-law into law. Yeah, thank you. Um, Leah, a, a, couple, uh, a couple of questions for you. Um, one question asks, what are some interesting student initiative groups uh, within the NUS law community that might pique the uh, interest of, you know, prospective students? And then somebody else asks uh, a question which a lot of people are interested in. They say, I am by nature quite shy and reserved. Would it be hard for me to consider law as a suitable profession since they think the most law students are outspoken and go-getters? All right, so for the first question about the student-initiated programs, so we have the overarching law club. Um, it's, a, it's a constituent of NUSU, which is the overarching um, NUS-wide student body representative. Um, and Law Club, we have many programs, I mean, many different directors. So you have things like Law Sports, which I think in a few days we have a competition against Madsen. So it's called um, Law Mad Games. So that's really interesting. We have like Touch Rugby, we have um, FIFA, even if you're in, into that. We have eSports as well. Um, so there's, if you're an athlete and you like playing sports, that will be definitely very interesting for you. Um, if you like artistic stuff, uh, in my term as a law arts director, so we kind of started this thing where we did like workshops, like terrarium making, um, pottery, painting, um, stuff like that. So if you want to get in touch with your artistic side, there's a lot of like music, theater clubs that are active actually in law school at the moment. And if you want to do more law related um, student activities, right? So we have like the mooting and debating club, for example. I think they've been running a lot of moots recently. Uh, we have the BA Malau moot, which um, a lot of prominent judges and prominent senior, um, senior counsel come down and they, they judge these moods. Um, we have, if, you're, if you like writing, we have a justified subclub. So that really, um, I mean, if you, and also if you want the law aspect, we have the Singapore Law Review, which is basically a student-run subclub which allows students to publish their own writings and articles. So if you have an interest in academia, um, this would be a good starting point. Yeah, so that's just, and if you're interested in things like mediation, if you're interested in things like the environment and environmental law, uh, we have subclubs for all of those. And especially in the recent past, we know that with the pandemic especially, there's also a lot of focus on student wellness, and that's what my club is doing right now. So we emphasize on things like just last semester, we had a, um, a few activities. For example, we actually went down to Eco Arcs uh, Stables, the, where we actually let students interact with horses, and that's kind of like pet therapy. And kind of, um, it's called animal assisted learning, and so you kind of learn how to manage your stress, um, how to develop as an individual. So there's a variety of student activities that are all student initiated. And if you, know, if you don't like mooting, don't worry, there's something else for you. Yeah, so um, that's what I'll say about the student-initiated interest groups. And for the second question about um, being shy and reserved, right? I actually have a lot of friends who are very, very introverted. And they, they hate class participation. Um, and they, you know, thinking of like going up and mooting is, is very, very intimidating for them. But they are very, very, um, but they actually are very good law students. I mean, grades wise, they don't suffer. And I think what I really appreciate about NUS Law, once again, as opposed to SMU, uh, is that we have a very, um, very comfortable right, class environment because of, like, whether in your seminars or in your tutorials, when students ask questions, they don't ask for the sake of class participation, but they actually ask because they're very interested or they have like certain things that they want to clarify. So there's no competitiveness there. There's no students stepping over each other. So it's a very comfortable environment to be in. Um, 
And I think another thing that I really appreciate as coming from the perspective of a student is that the professors here are very, very kind. And if you, let's say you're like very introverted or you're afraid to speak in class, you can actually just write into them and they'll accommodate and they'll understand and let you like class part in another way. So I think that's, um, if you're not very, you know, outspoken, you're not very like, um, you, as you put it, go-getter, like, don't worry. Law is still a profession for you and law is not just about going to the courtroom and you know, standing before a judge and making a speech. But I think what I've learned in law school is that there are so many different pathways as well um, that don't involve like, that, kind of, um, that kind of being able to articulate your thoughts in front of everybody. So if you're scared of public speaking, you don't have to worry about that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No I'll turn back to Simon for a couple questions, and then uh, there's one other one that I'll perhaps direct to Wayne. Uh, I'm going to extract from a long set of questions here uh, to ask two of them. One, are there plans to connect JC students with the curriculum of NU NUS Law through any attachment programs? And the other one is a more generic question. What are some words of advice for prospective law students uh, in achieving that balance between uh, well, work and life balance and getting uh, purpose and passion from the study of law. Right, so on the, on the junior college, um, I mean, I, I actually think it is quite important that university be significantly different from junior college. Uh, and so we've actually talked at the university about having a positive educational disruption uh, so that the, there is a real difference. Uh, the most obvious one is you're in control of your timetable eventually in a way that... Um, uh, that would be very unusual at junior college. I think the average contact hours is about 15 contact hours uh, for a law student. So you've got a lot of white space time. You can do the various activities that Leah was referring to. Uh, you've got to prepare for classes, but you can be doing competitions, you can be doing all sorts of things. Uh, so I actually think it's quite important that we have a disruption from junior college. Um, also, one of the things we've been trying to do at the university level, but especially at the faculty level in law, is try and encourage wide access to law school. So if you're watching this and you're from a junior college that doesn't send a lot of students to law school, uh, we're about to announce that the pilot initiative last year where we said if you're in the top 5% of any junior college, uh, you would be shortlisted uh, to come into law school if you apply to law school. Uh, we're about to extend that to 10%. Uh, so if you're interested in applying to law, uh, then, uh, then do please, uh, please do so. And don't worry about which junior college you're at. I emphasize that this does not mean we're cutting anyone off law school. All we're doing is essentially my colleagues and I will interview a, a significantly larger number of people to give them the chance to come into uh, law school. So that's the junior college uh, aspect. Uh, the other question, sorry, was the... Um, uh, what, what advice would you the, give to a prospective student to work-life balance and get passion? And... Right. So maybe I, sh I should address the question I said I didn't want to address, which is how to get into law school. It's like, <laughs> if you are shortlisted, What's going to happen? Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about resilience and this, this question that Leah also touched on uh, about um, uh, sort of work-life balance and, and sustainability of careers. In terms of the, the process, if you put in an application and if we shortlist you, uh, you then need to come onto campus, hopefully in person, but potentially um, remotely, uh, to do two things. Uh, one is an interview uh, and the other is a written test. So what are we looking for in that? Uh, we're basically in the interview, the 15 minute interview with two faculty members, we're looking for people who can form and defend an opinion. Uh, we don't expect you to know the law. We don't expect you to be an expert on the law. Please don't bone up on contract law and then say, ah, Professor Courtney, I'm gonna debate you on contract <laughs> law. That is a terrible mistake. If you can read the papers, we know that's a challenge for the guys doing NS, uh, but, but think about issues that are in the public domain, uh, so just what's in the news at the moment, you might be asked about the legality of what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, not because you're expected to know the details of the UN Charter, uh, but you're expected to be able to form and defend an opinion, to have an opinion, uh, and to be the kind of person that we want to have in the classroom. You don't have to be extroverted, as Leah was emphasising, but we do want people who can participate in a discussion. It's not meant to be threatening, it's not meant to be scary, but it's meant to really give us a chance to think about, okay, are you the kind of person who's gonna do well in the classroom, uh, even with all the support we offer, uh, but also for you to think about us. I mean, are we the kind of professors that you wanna have? So that's the interview. You'll also have a written test where you're given some information, for example, a kind of um, extract of a statute. Can you apply some rules to some facts? Again, you're not expected to know anything outside of the material we give you. Uh, it's not a rush, uh, and, uh, and it's an opportunity merely to see, okay, do you enjoy playing with words, 
playing with ideas and applying principles to real world uh, scenarios. So that's a bit about getting into law school. Now, this question about passion and sustainability and work-life balance. Candidly, work-life balance is something that you earn. It's not a human right. Uh, and so one of the things that I have to tell our students when they're graduating is, OK, you've done well to get into law school, to get through law school. You've passed all the exams. Now the real test begins. Can you survive in the, in the real world? You're going to have a completely different education in the workforce. And if you go to an employer, or imagine you're an employer, someone comes to you, and the first question they want to ask is, tell me about work-life balance. What the employer hears is, I'd like a job, but I don't want to work too hard. So it is hard to be a lawyer. It is sometimes stressful, uh, and it should be hard. And sometimes it should be stressful because you wield enormous power. I mean, if, if the fate of someone's liberty, if someone's economic livelihood is on the line, you should be concerned about doing your job well. All that said, I think the reason there is a public debate about this going on right now is we acknowledge that there are some problems in the profession. Candidly, I think there is a small amount we need to do at law school in terms of preparing people, but I think there's also a lot that needs to happen at the profession. And that's why the current Law Society president, um, Adrian Tan, has made this one of his uh, signature focal points, that he really wants to address this. Uh, and the reason this has been taken up is I think it's a concern to everyone if people are leaving a profession like the law, uh, because we need lawyers, not so that the lawyers get to make money, although obviously the lawyers are concerned about that, but because the rule of law is important to any society and to Singapore in particular. It's important to any society that it be just, that it be fair, that power is regulated and so on. It's particularly important to Singapore because as a small country that depends enormously on things like financial services, on global trade, Singapore has a special interest in the rule of law both domestically and internationally. That's why I think Singapore has come out very strongly on Ukraine, for example, mm -hmm. uh, because Singapore benefits from a rule of law ordered society both locally uh, and globally. Uh, so all this to say, I think the, the question really highlights a, a challenge that we acknowledge, that the profession acknowledges and is working on. And I hope by the time you come through law school, graduate, we will have addressed some of these concerns. Thanks, Simon. Um, Wayne, a couple of questions uh, for you. Um, one question is the, the, the questioner asked that, you know, the essays that they might write in junior college, particularly like the general papers, they seem, they have the impression that they're very different from university essays. So how will they know if they're going to be good at these essays in university uh, and that they will enjoy doing them? And the other question, which is kind of a fun one, is will we get gowns and get to wear the white wigs? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so I'll deal with the, those questions in order. Um, university education will be quite a shock for some of you, I think, and, and perhaps many of you. Uh, particularly if you've become used to a system where you think the object of education is to inhale information and then breathe it out on demand during exam. Okay, that, that's not really what we're about at university. And it's certainly not what we're about at NUS Law. And I was thinking when, when someone was talking about preparing for the interview, I can tell every year the students who have rehearsed their lines. They come in thinking, I've got the hot issue, now I'm going to tell you what I think about it. Uh, and of course, that all goes very badly wrong for them when I switch topics you know, fairly promptly, and then they're off script, and then it doesn't work at all. Uh, so what I look for, and I think my colleagues would be much the same if you're writing, say, an essay, is some sort of original thought or idea. Um, and it's quite difficult, because up to this point, at until you get to university, and even in your first years of university, you're used, used to being a consumer of knowledge. Right? Other people produce information that you absorb and then process, and to the extent you yourself produce knowledge, it's sort of probably internal. Uh, but as you get more advanced at law school and, and as a lawyer, you're going to become a producer of your own knowledge and knowledge for other people. And that's quite a, a revolution in the way of thinking, where you think, oh, OK, it's not just about me thinking about what other people say. I need to say something myself, to say something original or novel or thoughtful or critical about what others have said. And so I find that's probably the, the hardest mental shift uh, law students have. And they're also puzzled because they think, some of them, that when they write an essay, the ultimate objective is to say what the lecturer wants to hear. Right? So um, you know, in, in my tutorials, a common question I get in first year is, so in the exam, should I write whatever? And I now make a buzzer sound whenever student. Leah probably got that, I think, yeah. when she was a student. I make a buzzer sound saying, you know, that's, that's a forbidden question. All right. 
And um, or they'll, they'll answer a part of a question I've set them, they'll say, well, well what do you think, Prof? I say, yeah, what I think doesn't really matter. Uh, one of the, the things about university, and maybe about lawyers in particular, is we are perfectly comfortable with hearing things we don't like as long as we think they're well-reasoned and persuasive. Uh, and so, so to me, I think that's the biggest shift in thinking. Um, some people will adapt to that pretty quickly. Some people won't. But that doesn't mean you're going to be a bad lawyer in your future. Okay? Some people just acclimatize to law school quite rapidly, you know, but others take a year or so. So I wouldn't stress too much about that. I think to pick up on what, on what Simon said, what, what's more important for me is that you have intrinsic motivations rather than extrinsic motivations. So it's the fact you love words, discussion, argument in a good way as opposed to argument in a bad way. Um, you like concepts, you like thinking about what the world could be and, and wondering why it is the way it is. Those sorts of things I think are valuable. Um, even the desire and, and you know, the sort of the, the sort of altruistic desire to change things and help people, they're also very valuable. Students who come in with, I think, extrinsic motivations, things like, well, mum and dad want me to do this, I want to do this so I can go on TikTok or Instagram and wave my contracts textbook around, I think I'm going to make a lot of money. Um, honestly, if you want to make a lot of money for less work, do dentistry. Um, you know, I think those sort of motivations, they work up to a point. And then my experience, because I, I practice law, is by about the second year or third year of practice, those extrinsic motivations don't work anymore, right? Because people are facing pretty long hours, pretty stressful work, and law is no longer glamorous. You know, it's, they're not interested in bragging about it on Instagram. And so for me, I think it's those in, intrinsic motivations that will carry you through law school and also lead you to have a fulfilling career. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, Simon, I'll come back. I'll, I'll go to you now for a couple of questions. Uh, two that I'm going to link together. And then one is uh, really about the interaction of NUS College and uh, the law school. So that one is, uh, let, me, let me start with that one. That one is, should I be, you know, if I'm interested in Exchange Plus, should I still kind of do the NUS, go down the NUS college route? Um, and the other question, these are two questions about careers. And one is talking about employability, saying, you know, which is, which is considered more employable, NUS or SMU? And then, you know, what are some career pathways that uh, law graduates go on to do? Right, so on, on NUS College, I mean, NUS College remains a work in progress. We just had the open day, the virtual one, last Saturday, and we've got physical open days for both law and NUS College on Saturday. Uh, and so this, this is a moving target, if you like. Uh, the the question is quite a narrow, focused one on Exchange Plus, which, as Wayne said, is a, is a bespoke law program that enables you to spend an entire year at another law school, usually paying their fees as well. Uh, and I believe, but would refer you to the FAQs page, I think that would be a challenge to combine with NUS College. And, but it raises a larger point that you can't and shouldn't try to do everything. Uh, as I said earlier, one of the things that is different about this moment, a bit like the way Wayne was describing uh, the university, you are in charge of your education and you're going to have to make some choices. So when I was a student, there was a brief moment when I thought about doing a combined degree of law and medicine, which was being created, I now realize in retrospect, for people who couldn't decide. Uh, and they were bright, able people. And I can imagine if we organized a law medicine module that was like nine years long, people would think about doing it. It would be a terrible mistake uh, because I think you do need to start deciding. Uh, so NUS College offers all sorts of things uh, in terms of the rich interdisciplinary training. Uh, but, uh, but it's not compatible with every program uh, that, that the university offers. We're working on medicine and dentistry. Uh, the dentist will hear about this, Wayne, uh, but, um, uh, but not necessarily combining with everything. Um, on, on the second question, sorry, I'm now having focused on the first one. Yes, uh, so it was about uh, the career pathways and the oh, career yes. trajectories and then perhaps job prospects for a Yeah, so with this, I'll... I'll Go back to when I was first appointed dean a decade ago. One of the things that really struck me uh, was that at NUS Law, we tended to celebrate primarily the people who'd gone on to very traditional legal pathways. And, and this is an incredibly distinguished group, the chief justices, the attorney generals, ministers, and lawyers, and so on. But we also have people who've gone on to many other career paths, uh, who've become diplomats, playwrights, artists, entrepreneurs, uh, people who run restaurants. Uh, and I think this goes back to the, the kind of intrinsic motivation that Wayne was talking about, 
that these people were motivated by a desire that wasn't just to be a thing, a lawyer, but to develop skills. And so the skills of being a good writer, I think, heavily overlap with the skills of being a good lawyer. You need to be able to manipulate words to play with words. Uh, and so what we've tried quite consciously to do in the law school is celebrate, obviously, the pathways uh, where people become lawyers, uh, but also those other careers, the diplomats, the politicians, the entrepreneurs, and so on, the, the uh, head of Razor, if you're a gamer, uh, Tan Men Liang is one of our, is one of our graduates, uh, Priscilla Shunmugam, a fashion designer, one of our graduates. So we've got people who've gone on to all sorts of different careers. Uh, and so what we try to do is give you skills that obviously will make you a good lawyer. That's our primary job, our primary responsibility locally is to ensure that the pool of legal talent in Singapore continues to grow. But that's not all we do. We want to do much more than that uh, and give people opportunities. Uh, and just one last word on this sort of uh, what's sometimes called the attrition, the number of people that drop out of law. It doesn't actually mean they're not using their law schools. Some of those other people I mentioned are using their law, law skills. I mean, Tommy Coe, when he was helping negotiate the Law of the Sea Convention, was using his legal skills. But there is a whole large category uh, of people that aren't always counted as lawyers who are working as in-house counsel, which means they're the lawyers within an organisation. And they are definitely using their legal skills. Uh, but sometimes it's people who decide they would prefer to have an in-depth relationship with one client rather than spreading themselves across lots of clients. Uh, and for work-life balance, for some people, that works out quite well. Thanks, Simon. Um, Leah, do you want to speak a little bit about career pathways that you see perhaps coming from that your, your, your colleagues and your fellow students are pursuing? Right. So I think um, just based on the internships that I've done alone or the opportunities that I've seen my seniors do. Um, so as Prof Simon mentioned, like there's legal tech. So um, there are a lot of upcoming legal tech firms like Intellex is one of them. Um, there's also, I think we, we, we had a webinar like a few year, years ago, like two years ago, where we had um, Willin Lowe, Priscilla Shamangam and um, Ivan Hing. So they are respectively um, a cook, a, a chef. And then she's, Priscilla is a, um, I think she's a fashion designer. Uh, one of Singapore's best, and then um, I think Ivan Heng is the director of Wild Rice, one of Singapore's leading theatres. Um, so that's in the arts industry, and then um, you obviously have your in-house counsel, um, you have your uh, different like people working for different companies as like compliance officers, um, as regulators in the government service. So there's so many pathways, and what I've and politicians especially. I think we have so many politicians from NUS Law. So I really think that like. As a law student, you get exposed to so many different people who have who are alumni, alumni of NUS Law, and they studied um, here. And then you have networks, you have the connections, and you meet all these new people. So you really, I mean, our careers team is great, and they'll have all these talks. So when you enter law school, don't worry. All these opportunities are there for you to explore, um, and you don't have to just pigeonhole yourself into uh, a career in, in, in law in the future. Yeah. Thanks. So you have one question. Somebody else asked, it was more of a comment. So they said they thought Professor Chesterman was very, very <laughs> cool and uh, wondered if they got to meet him at the interview. Do you agree? Is Professor Chesterman very, very cool? Yes. <laughs> He's our Captain Kirk. <laughs> Thanks. I think, was I asked a question about SMU versus NUS employability? Oh, yes. Yes. So maybe just to address that, um, candidly, I, SMU, all joking aside, SMU is a very good law school. The graduates of both NUS and SMU the vast majority get employed. You can look at the Graduate Employment Survey. Both law schools are in the mid-90% uh, employment rate. You will be, you'll be safe if you go to either law school. Uh, the problem I have with that is it only measures what happens one year after law school, uh, and it measures things like salary. Much more important to me is where people go years later uh, and what they go on to achieve, and I think that's a better measure of, of the success of an education. Great. Thank you. Uh, Wayne, a series of questions that are uh, perhaps a little bit uh, uh, technical, but they're asking specific things, so let me um, put them to you. The first one is about a capstone. So they say that SMU has recently uh, introduced a capstone program and a preterm uh, introduction program. Are there any plans at NUS Law for this? Sure. Also, uh, SMU, they say, allows a second major, and do we uh, allow this, or what are our thoughts about that? I'll do those in reverse order because I think the second one's a bit easier to solve than the first. Uh, and then we might need to wrap up shortly. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, the way our program works is there's only space for one. We call it a minor. Maybe it's equivalent to an SMU major. Um, 
Because as I said, our, our program only lets you have about three semesters and a bit of electives. And we figured that by the time you use up a, a whole one of those semesters for minor, that's probably enough. If you start doing more, you'll in fact do more non-law subjects than law electives, which um, is, is not what we want. Our view is that if you want that really broad experience, just choose a different kind of buffet. So choose a double degree program or choose the law and US college program instead. Um, in terms of the, the sort of the pre and post um, events, the law faculty itself doesn't run um, a distinct kind of formal scholastic pre-enrollment system or pre-semester system. Uh, law Club is actually very active in running um, an orientation program where you get to know it, you get to meet everyone, which I think is a great icebreaker. There's lots of games and events, and, uh, and you know, maybe Leah can comment on that. Uh, but I think that tends to work really well. And of course, you know, we know that you're coming from college, so the first few weeks, it's, it's not like army boot camp where we're going to try and break your spirit. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're generally pretty, pretty polite and gentle, at least for the first semester or so. Um, so don't worry too much about that. In terms of a capstone, uh, it's something we've debated from time to time. The Yale and US program, the, the, the combination with uh, law, did have a capstone project. Uh, We've not gone with that option for law generally or with our other degree programs. There's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, some of our other degree programs already have interdisciplinary modules in them. So if you're doing law and economics, you'll have to do some combined sort of economics-y law type modules. Um, we need to leave space for honors in your other degree. So we don't want to do a law capstone. Uh, what we think of doing, as, as far as we're concerned, if you want a capstone experience, is we have modules you can do that are research focused on a topic of your choice, um, which is getting towards being a capstone experience. So in, in your final year, what you can do is you can go and find a professor you like or whose area interests you, approach them and say, look, prof, I'm interested in doing a, a something on X, um, and they will supervise you for a, a whole semester, and uh, you'll get a deep sort of experience in, in looking in something that really, really fascinates you. Uh, so that's what we do uh, you know, at NUS. Great, so I think that's uh, all the time we have for questions. Uh, so thank you all for answering, and Wayne, well, over no, So here. thanks everyone, thanks for joining us uh, for this session. Uh, for those of you who are already thinking ahead for postgraduate studies, or maybe you've got a family member who wants to do a JD, uh, please tune back in at seven, I think it is, at 7 p.m. Yes. Um, and then you'll get to see a lot more of Arif and Simon and less of me, uh, which is a bonus. <laughs> um, I also want to thank the panel, so thanks to Leia for coming along and giving the student perspective, which I, I think in some ways is more important for you guys than hearing from us. Can I, uh, can I just say, because there's a question about if you want to speak to a current student, you can just go to NUS Law Club on Instagram. You can just DM us, and I'm pretty sure that they'll, they'll be more than happy to answer you. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, thanks to Simon and Arif. Uh, if you have any further questions, there should be a link that's going to be put on the screen or has been put on the screen already, I hope. Uh, so you can send an email to that address, and, and we'll try and help you out. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, I hope... We've both given you information about NUS so you, so you know what we offer and maybe also encouraged you to apply, uh, which I think would be great. And look, all going well. Maybe we'll see you here in August. Thank you.